five. It's so good to, ooh, that's probably why it was right in my, it's so good to see you all. It's good to be back together. Thank you for braving the cold, damp California weather to be here. Uh, we're so delighted today to have a guest to talk to us about the life and times of Isaiah the prophet. But before we get to that, I'm just going to invite us into a short uh, prayer of thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. We are grateful, God, for this community, for the many friendships and connections we have with one another, for this opportunity to learn more about such an important part of our tradition, part of what informs our faith. So thank you for this blessing. Thank you for our guest. Thank you for the food we've received. We pray that what we learn and hear here will continue to shape us as your people who are uh, in this world, loving it, hoping to love it as you love it. In Christ's name, amen. And now, uh, Dan Keating is going to introduce our speaker. I have an, introduc I have an introduction, which I practice, so... I'd like to begin this Saints Alive with a reading from Luke chapter 4. When he came to Nazareth, when he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. In studying the origins of Christianity, it is evident that the earliest Christians saw Jesus as the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. Of all of the books of the Hebrew Bible, the book of Isaiah is cited in the New Testament far more than any other book apart from the Psalms. To help us better understand who Isaiah was and thus how the book came to be central to Christian self-understanding, we are very fortunate to have a biblical scholar of international renown, Dr. Bill Schneiderwin, Professor of Near Eastern Languages and Culture at UCLA. Bill is also on the steering committee of the UCLA Center for the Study of Religion. The center's calendar of public events is on the tables. Bill's areas of teaching and research include the Hebrew Bible, ancient Israelite history, history of the Hebrew language, and the Dead Sea Scrolls. As part of the UCLA program of senior scholars, which is open to all seniors to apply, I found the time that I have spent auditing classes in his department to have been some of the most engaging and enjoyable hours of retirement. I know as Bill speaks, you'll experience the same excitement and intellectual engagement with our common biblical inheritance. Oh, hey, there we are. Well, it's really a privilege to be here with you today. Very excited about this topic. Um, I'm really glad to be invited, Dan. I'm Delighted that you read that the passage from Isaiah, because I think about it um, 
when I think about the importance of Isaiah, you know, there are reasons that it was, it, the book of Isaiah was quoted in, in or read in the, in the synagogue, probably in most synagogues in the time of Jesus, they probably only had three or four or five books of the Bible. They might have, and when they were calling up to Jerusalem, they were saying, hey, you know, I want a I wanna scroll for synagogue reading. And they'd say, well, what, what do you want? And they'd say, well, can we have Deuteronomy? And then they'd say, well, can we have Psalms? And then they'd say, can I buy a copy of the book of Isaiah? And so they'd have a, a set of scrolls, but they didn't necessarily have, a, have an entire um, group of scrolls. They, they only had a few of them, most smaller synagogues. So Isaiah was one of the books that they had. That's why it's quoted the most in the, um, in the New Testament. That's why it's quoted, or that's why in the, De in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's one of the most frequent scrolls that you find. Isaiah was the important um, prophet, and he was the pro pro par, par excellence. And so what I want to do today is kind of give you a little bit of a clue of why Isaiah was so important. Um, and, and, and you'll have to forgive me because I'm really excited about this. And so I kind of stuffed way too much stuff into this. Um, but um, we'll have some fun here. So let me start with the beginning, of the beginning of the book and learn a few things from this. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amoz, which he saw concerning Judah and Jer Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Yotham, Ahaz and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah. So basically what we're talking about in terms of the life of times of Isaiah is the late 8th century BC, especially in the times of um, Ahaz and Hezekiah are the heyday of King um, of Isaiah the prophet. And there are a couple really significant social political issues that are going on in these day days that I think are relevant to our times one is immigration or refugees. Um, there, there are going to be huge numbers of refugees that are going to come into Jerusalem, specifically in the late 8th century of different types. And they're going to be, and this is going to reflect some of the social conflict of uh, Isaiah's own time, that, and because of the different composition of the refugees. Some of, their, some of them, as we'll see, are going to be more progressive in terms of their religious output look, and some of them are going to be more conservative in terms of their religious output look. And so you're going to have this clash that's going on. And there, in terms of the politics of the late 8th and 7th centuries BC in Judah, you're going to have this pendulum swing of politics from someone like Hez, uh, Ahaz, you know, uh, Trumpian, to someone like Barack Obama, who, you know, uh, conservative to liberal, back and forth, um, Manasseh, uh, Josiah, conservative religious reforms. The, this is sort of a pendulum swing of the society that really begins with the immigration and the events of the time of, uh, of uh, Isaiah. So I think for that reason, the times of Isaiah are really, really uh, uh, critical for us to understand. Okay. Um, I didn't want to do that. I don't think I did that. Now I, now I have to find where it is. Um, I've got it. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Fortunately, this, is a, this isn't my computer, but it's the same computer as mine. So... Um, Oops, let's go back to link. So uh, let's go, here we are. Um, the first verse of the book of Isaiah tells you something about the book itself. It's a third person account of the book of Isaiah. This verse wasn't written by Isaiah the prophet. But if you go, whoops, wow doesn't like me at all, does it? I think it's because I'm using this funny thing and, I, and I, uh, I'm learning on the fly with my pencil. Um, 
He compared Isaiah 1 with Isaiah 6, 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Who saw the Lord? I did. Think about verse 1, right? A third person report to Isaiah chapter 6, where you get a first person report. And this continues, and that also tells you, kind of gives you the beginning of the ministry of Isaiah. You can go to the next passage that I want to talk about in terms of the formation of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah um, chapter 8, you know, bind up the testimony, seal the teaching among my first person voice. See, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel, the Lord of hosts who dwells on uh, Mount Zion. So these are one of the, or some of the very few places in the book of Isaiah, just a couple places where you actually get the first person voice of the book of, uh, of the Isaiah the prophet. Most of the book is told in the third person. But part of what's happening probably in terms of being told in the third person is also being told in this book, right? Or in this verse. See, seal the teaching among my students, right? Isaiah has students, limudim in Hebrew, right? He has disciples or students, and they're collecting the, his stuff. I and the children, children here probably doesn't necessarily mean just Isaiah's physical children, but it, it also includes his apprentices, people who are working with him, who are part of a larger group of, quote-unquote, the sons of the prophet. Um, and these people are collecting the book of Isaiah and creating the book as we know it. And then you go to another example of like what's going on in the formation of the book of Isaiah. Um, these are the famous chapters. It should say Isaiah 37 through 39. But if you can look in 2 Kings 18 through 20, these chapters are almost exactly the same. So what does that mean about the book of Isaiah? Apparently, when they were putting together the book of Isaiah, later scribes are, col uh, are collecting um, the book, and then they're saying, hey, you know, these chapters from the book of Kings are relevant to our story. We need to, under in order to understand this next oracle um, of Isaiah, we need, you know, this sort of historical context. So later scribes are doing this in the book of Isaiah. Or we can look at other uh, passages from the book of Isaiah. For example, Isaiah 45, when it says, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus. Who is Cyrus? Cyrus is the king of Persia who lives in the 6th century BC. Um, what are they doing here? Why is Cyrus, who lives, you know, a century after or more after Isaiah, here? Because the, Isaiah and his oracles are so important that later scribes are interpreting the book of Isaiah and they're reapplying the book of Isaiah. Just like when we get to the book of Matthew, they're interpreting and reapplying the book of Isaiah and the Messiah oracles in Isaiah to another person, this case, in this case, Jesus. This reinterpretation of the Messianic oracles was going on over and over again in the generations leading up to Jesus. This is happening over and over again. So you get different kinds of things that are going on in the book of Isaiah. Why? Because Isaiah was so important. The figure of the historical Isaiah was such a revolutionary and significant figure that his book became the thing that people were reading and rereading and reapplying through the generations until we get a canonical book that sort of freezes the, the process but they're collecting and applying Isaiah's oracles through the generations. And that's what you see in these kind of different texts. Okay, let's go to the time, the Jerusalem of Isaiah, the Jerusalem. And here's my uh, artist reconstruction of Jerusalem in the days of Isaiah. You know, the city of Jerusalem starts in the time of David with this city of David, which is a hot dog shaped hill here, surrounded by the Kidron Valley and the Central Valley. And then it moves to the north. King Solomon move, um, builds the temple in the, the late tenth, uh, in the 10th century. And, and the Ophel, whoops, and the Ophel 
uh, area to the north. And then Jerusalem begins to slowly grow in the, you know, 9th century into the 8th century um, until you get to the late 8th century when, then there, when there's a really explosion in the population of the city of Jerusalem. The entire western hill of Jerusalem gets populated in the late 8th and early 7th centuries. Uh, a lot of the new um, people who are living there are immigrants. And where do those immigrants come from? Why does Jerusalem grow so radically in, over the course of a couple generations, a couple decades? Um, and the story all, and, and here's sort of a, a look of, of what I'm talking about and sketching it. This is the city of Jerusalem in the 10th century, King Solomon. Uh, Jerusalem is so, uh, located there. It's about 40 acres, which is about one-tenth the size of UCLA's campus. There's maybe 2,000 people. This population is really hard to, to estimate, you know, anywhere from 2,000 to maybe 8,000. Um, but if the city was going to grow, it had to grow to the west, and that's what it does. It grows to the west, and then you can see by the, the graphic here just how much bigger Jerusalem becomes in the late 8th century than it was in the generations prior to it. There's a 500% increase in Jerusalem's population from the time of Solomon to the time of King Hezekiah or Isaiah. And that, most of that happens in a couple decades, two or three decades in the 8th in the century. The population, you, so you have urban, is it massive urbanization, but you also have this massive centralization of government and people in and around Jerusalem. Jerusalem becomes the demographic central place as well as the, um, the uh, major city. Before that, Jerusalem was sort of a cow town, small town, but Jerusalem really becomes a major city in the late 8th century. Okay, um, so why? I mean, this is really the story. It happens because of the Assyrian Empire. You have a series of campaigns where Assyria takes over the West, it, you know, Phoenicia, Syria, down to Samaria, and finally down to Ju uh, Judah in uh, a, a variety of different campaigns with the Assyrian kings. You know, here's sort of the march of the Assyrian Empire that begins in 745 BC, begins with Tiglath Pileser III, who's known as Pol in the Hebrew Bible, um, who reigns from 745 to 727. He conquers Galilee, or the northern, uh, northern part of the northern kingdom, and truncates the northern kingdom. And then his son, Tiglath Pileser V, conquers Samaria and exiles Samaria. Um, Shalmaneser V's son, Sargon II, conquers Philistia, also begins to sort of chop away at the kingdom of Judah. Um, and then Sennacherib comes in 705 to 781, conquers Judah, and then eventually, you know, the Assyrians under Esna had them reach all the way to um, Egypt. And this is the first world empire, right? The Assyrians are the first world empire, and they ruled through terror and um, power. And here's a good, uh, and during this period, you get two different waves of, F, uh, of refugees. And it's really important to emphasize that there are two different waves of, of refugees. The first wave of ref refugees come in, um, in the conquest of Samaria, um, right? What happens during war, right? What happens during war? We see in our cur current times what happens during war. You get refugees, right? People are fleeing Ukraine now. People were fleeing Syria. Different kinds of people though, right? The Ukrainians are different than the people that are fleeing from Syria. Well. These are people that are free, fleeing from Samaria. Um, a lot of them are, I would say, political and um, administrative elites. And we have, in my new book, I talk about them, um, but I'm not going to talk about them now. We have some of the fingerprints of some of these individuals in the archaeological and inscription re inscriptional record. They were kind of the political, um, administrative elites of the northern kingdom, you know, had the means to um, flee to the south, and they become um, part of the administration of Judah under Hezekiah and Manasseh. But then you get a second wave of refugees in the um, campaigns of King Sennacherib. Sennacherib comes, he destroys all the Judean villages, um, 
and you get refugees into Jerusalem that are all uh, essentially, you know, refugees from villages, small villages in, in Judah and Judea um, co are coming into Jerusalem. Now you have like two huge sets of refugees. One are sort of northerners, different kinds of religious, political beliefs, um, tend to be a lot of elites. And then you have a second um, a group of people who are coming into Jerusalem who are a bunch of villagers from Judean, small Judean villages. And what I can see is also the cultural conflict of the different kinds of refugees that are coming into Jerusalem. And this is going to play itself out in um, the history of, of Judah in the last uh, centuries. And one of the verses that I really like, I could have given you dozens of verses like this. I like to talk about, you know, this theme, uh, especially you see it in the Deuteronomy, in the book of Deuteronomy, of uh, the refugee or the, the resident alien. They like to translate Gera as resident alien. But if you put it in this context, what is a resident alien? It's really an immigrant or a refugee. You know, Deuteronomy is interested in social justice. The prophets are interested in social justice. They're interested in the, the casualties of this war that's going on, especially um, in a variety of times, but especially in the late 8th and 7th centuries, right? And so they're interested in the refugee, the orphan, and the widow, right? The widow, the orphan, and the, and the, and the refugee. These are the three major concerns. Why do you get this as a repeated theme of the Hebrew Bible? At the, in, a, in a number of texts, prophetic texts, the book of Deuteronomy, because of the events that are going on in the times of Isaiah. Okay. So, how are the Assyrians doing this? I can give you lots of gory pictures of Assyrian reliefs, and they're kind of fun, not so fun. Um, but the Assyrians did it through um, fear, right? The empire, the Assyrian empire creates fear. Um, when somebody rebelled, you know, they made a point of them. They would impale people outside the walls of cities. So when you're walking in the city, this city rebelled against the, uh, the Assyrians. And um, this is what happens to you. you if you weren't um, impaled on outside the walls, you were exiled in, out of your land to some other place. And here you see um, one illustration of this. You can see Hezekiah, right, trying to address the Assyrian, uh, the Assyrians in a variety of different ways. He fortifies the city of Jerusalem. He enhances the water supply of the city of Jerusalem. And he creates a government bureaucracy to, you know, deal with the social services and uh, military um, things that are going on in Jerusalem. This is a, uh, a picture of the excavations on the Western Hill that were done in the 1970s and the, ma 70s, and the major um, discovery there, among other things, was the so-called broad wall, which was a 22 foot across, these are the foundations of the wall. It's 22 feet across, right? Um, they're fortifying themselves against the Assyrian invasion. They don't want to be impaled outside the city of Jerusalem, right? Um, so it's absolutely amazing. And there's a really interesting, and so they're moving out um, from the, the city of Jerusalem uh, and fortifying, fortifying the Western Hill. Why? Because where do all these refugees go? All these refugees that are coming into Jerusalem went into the Western Hill of Jerusalem. Um, and the broad wall is encircling the western hill with a major fortification. You can see in the, in the bottom corner right here, and let's do a little um, close-up. Um, we can see here, there's the broad wall in the red, and see in the, the yellow there? Those are houses. And those houses archaeologically are under the, um, under the broad wall. So those houses were built in an, as an unwalled suburb of the city of Jerusalem in the 8th century. Why do you build your house outside the, the, the security of the walls? Because you're a refugee, right? And then Hezekiah comes along and he fortifies it. And I love this passage in Isaiah. On that day, you know, Isaiah says, you looked to the weapons of the house of the forest and you saw there were many breaches in the city of David, and you collected the waters of the wa lower pool, 
and you counted the houses of Jerusalem and you broke down the houses to fortify the wall. It's like archaeology <laughs> of it in Isaiah's day is like illustrated here in the words of Isaiah. And you made a reservoir between the two walls for the water of the old pool, but you did not look to him who did it, nor did you have regard from him who planned it long ago. So Isaiah is castigating, you know, Hezekiah for trusting in, like, all these government works instead of actually trusting in God first. But it, but it tells you a lot about what's going on in Jerusalem, right? They're, they have needs. What are their needs? They need to fortify. Unfortified. They have a whole bunch of new people who are un, living in unwalled part of the city. And they're addressing water, right? Why do they need to address water? Because suddenly, if I've got a huge influx of more people, then I need a lot more water to address um, uh, in Jerusalem. And you see this archaeologically in a number of pla ways, uh, the water uh, supply. Uh, one thing, major thing is Hezekiah's tunnel, which was built from the Gihon Spring on the eastern side of the city of David um, and brought water to the western side of the city of David to the place called the Pool of Sil Siloam. There's a beautiful inscription found inside the tunnel that describes the tunneling activities that were uh, done by King Hezekiah, bringing water from the eastern um, part of the city of David to the base of the western hill, right closer to the new population. There are other water works that were done as well. And of course, we know about the Pool of Siloam. The Pool of Siloam is pre presently being excavated in Jerusalem. Huge excavations, you know, salvage excavations of the Pools of Siloam. And of course, they appear in the New Testament, but they go back to the time of um, um, uh, Hezekiah. And they bring, and the purpose of it is to bring water close to the, closer to the the new population on the western hill of the city of Jerusalem. Okay, and the third thing that, that's happening is administration, like government bureaucracy, right? They're taxing you, <laughs> and they're, I mean, they've got a lot of things to do, right? And so in order to do them successfully, whoops, in order to do them successfully, they need to do administrate, they need to build up and bolster the government administration, and so you see these huge royal storage jars are like this tall and there's some scoops here and on the handles of these uh, storage jars you get these um, uh, stamps. The top uh, part of the stamp, you know, you have belonging to the king, Lamelech, um, on all of these different things. On the bottom you have the names of four different cities. In this case, the city of Hebron uh, is mentioned. Um, and these sites are found, these seals and jars are found in the hundreds in different excavations throughout Israel dating to the late 8th century BC. So these are clearly, this is clearly government administration, government um, that is taking place specifically in the time of King Hezekiah. And you know how people get all riled up when you start taxing them, right? <laughs> well, you can imagine the kinds of things that are going on. On the one hand, you have the threat of Assyria, so we need to do this. On the other hand, that means we're conscripting you for work, we're taking your, your crops and other kinds of goods and, and taxing you to pay for it, right? So there's this conflict that is specific to the time of Hezekiah that you didn't have before this. Okay, one of the great illustrations of this conflict is the city of Lachish, or Lachish. Um, it's found in the foothills of Jerusalem, or in the, in the foothills of Judah, um, about 30 miles away from Jerusalem. It was the second most important city of Judah, and it's highlighted in the conquest reliefs of Sennacherib, um, of a, uh, the king of Assyria, who came and conquered Judah in the 701 BC. And you see right here in this, uh, relief, you've got the city of Lachish represented by the, um, the tower here. You have, you know, people on the tower sort of, you know, defending against the Assyrians who are um, coming out against, with ramparts against the city of uh, Lachish. But of course, you know, the end of the story is people are being exiled from um, Judah and Judea. Um, now the question is, 
when you look at that, so, and, uh, at the end of the relief, of course, we have King uh, Sennacherib on his throne with, you know, various people coming and paying their tribute and honoring the, the Assyrian king. Now the question is, why? Um, and you see um, what's going on uh, with Jerusalem. So the question is, like, why does um, Sennacherib mention, or have in his palace reliefs the city of Lachish? Why doesn't he have the city of Jerusalem? Right? I mean, what, what's Lachish? How many of you have ever heard of Lachish before today? Right? Nobody, how many of you have heard of Jerusalem before today? Right? Like, it, it was the same in ancient times. Like, everybody in Assyria probably had heard of Jerusalem, but nobody had heard of Lachish. Right? So why do you do Lachish? Because, well, they didn't conquer Jerusalem. Um, the king of Assyria comes up. Uh, Hezekiah apparently says, you know, I've done wrong. I didn't mean to, um, to uh, rebel against you. And the king of Sumer, uh, Assyria demands um, tribute, and Hezekiah pays tribute, and, and, and it's done, right? That's one version of the story. Another version of the story is, is that the, um, the angel of the Lord comes in the middle of the night, right? And sends a plague against the Assyrian army, and the Assyrians are forced to withdraw. Either version of this story uh, tells an important thing, which is the Assyrians never let rebe rebellious states go away unscathed. If you rebelled against Assyria, you were impaled outside your wall, or you were exiled. You didn't just get to go, oh, I paid a few bucks and, 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 and get off scot-free. Something happened. Um, Something happened and Jerusalem was delivered in the time of Isaiah. Something happened. Like, I can't tell you exactly what happened. You know, I know one story is that he paid some tribute. I believe that. One story is that the angel of the Lord struck the Assyrians. I believe that too. But whatever happened, right, it made a huge impact on the psychology of Judeans at this time. And who is the main figure for this? Isaiah of Jerusalem. King Hezekiah, what does he do? He goes to Isaiah. He hears about the Assyrians coming against him. He sends to the prophet Isaiah, and Isaiah says, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I have heard of your prayer to me and, and King Sennacherib of Assyria. And that very night, the angel of the Lord sat down, and he struck out, down 185,000 in the camp of the Syrians, and when morning dawned, they were all dead bodies, right? Something happened. Isaiah is the critical uh, figure there, right? Um, and you get versions of the story told in different ways in, um, of this, these times told in different ways in different texts. I mean, this is a passage that most of you know really well from the end of it, but I li really like the beginning of this, right? But there will be no gloom for those who are in anguish. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, Naphtali but in the latter time, he will make glory, glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations, the people who walked in darkness. What is he talking about, right? One of the things in the context of Isaiah of Jerusalem that he's talking about that would have resonated to everyone sitting in Jerusalem with all these refugees from the north, right? That was the land that was in darkness. And the Assyrians had already destroyed Galilee. He had already destroyed the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali. They were gone, right? Now Isaiah was uh, talking about... Um, the catastrophe that had happened in the north, right? The people who are walking in darkness are those poor Israelites whose land was destroyed and who were exiled and now were living, many of them, am among uh, the, uh, the Israelites and or the Judeans in Jerusalem. And then it gives this vision of promise, you know, 
For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, authority rests upon his shoulder, and he will be called Wonderful Counsel, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. Now, we as Christians, we look at it in our modern context, but imagine yourself in the late 8th century um, reading this oracle of Isaiah. Who is the son that's going to give peace or authority? People were always looking for this person. Who was the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy? They were looking for it in Isaiah's own day with the sons of Hezekiah, um, Josiah for one, um, in the book of Kings, draws upon this. But then Cyrus, you know, draws upon this oracle as well. And then, of course, Matthew will, and the Gospels will draw on this as well, right? Um, okay, so what develops Zion theology? Is that, and let me see, where am I? Do I have a lot of time, a little time? It's 1.10. Okay. Um, so what develops is Zion theology. I just want to make sure I get to, like, the, the real fun part. And this is really fun, but um, Zion theology develops. And what is Zion theology? The Zion theology is this belief, whoops, oh no, this belief that God will save us no matter what. Um, Yes, I want to say a report. There's a problem. But, um, but we all fix it. So Zion theology is this belief that, there's a, um, that God will save us no matter what. God is going to save us. Um, yeah. And you see in all kinds of places in Scripture this idea of Zion theology um, you see it in, for example, the book of Isaiah at the beginning, and it talks about all the nations are going to come to the mountain of the, whore, of the Lord, to the house of uh, the God of Israel. You know, Psalms are going to talk about, you know, God's abode, where God dwells on, on, uh, on his mighty hill. Psalm 48 um, talks about, you know, Mount Zion, God's holy mountain, the city of the great king with its citadels God has shown as a shore of defense. Or, you know, Psalm 125, Jerusalem or Mount Zion is, cannot be moved. It abides forever. There develops this idea that Jerusalem is God's city and it can't be destroyed. What, why does this develop? Because God just saved us from the Assyrians, right? God just sa if God saved us from the Assyrians then God must have chosen us and the city of Jerusalem and his temple, and it can never be touched. And so there develops this idea of the inviability of Jerusalem or Zion theology in the late 8th and 7th century. Okay, so I want to shift here um, from this background to some a little bit more concrete things about Isaiah the prophet that have developed in the archaeological re record just recently. This was an article that came out in uh, Biblical Archaeology Review, if you read that journal. Um, is this the, the uh, Prophet Isaiah's signature? And it's a, uh, uh, a seal impression. Now, what's a seal impression? Well, I mean, you guys know. I mean, you remember when you were younger, you had those little kits with the wax kits, and you had a seal, and you sealed things? Well, in ancient Israel, they did it with clay. You'd have a, a, a signet ring, like this is a signet ring that was uh, found uh, belonging to Hanan, the son of Hilkiah, the priest. And, and, you, and the letters are written in mirror writing, and you impress it on something, usually on a piece of clay, to seal a document, right? And we know about this. It's actually reflected in all over the uh, scriptures, but, you know, here are just a couple of examples in the book of Isaiah. In the passage we cited um, in... Isaiah 8, bind up the testimony, seal, seal the teaching, right? This is a reflection of this pervasive new technology that's being used um, in the late 8th and 7th centuries that is writing and sealing documents. Isaiah 29, another place where it talks about the vision 
um, for you are like the words of a sealed document. If it is given to you, those who can read with the command, read this. And they say, we can't because you sealed it, right? You put a seal on it and you close the document. So there are these seals um, that you find in excavation. And here's what we found um, in one of these seals. Now the question is like, why is this so important, this particular seal? Well, I think it's important because it's going to tell us something about Isaiah of Jerusalem. And it's going to tell me something about the history of prophet as a title. Um, so here's a, a picture of the seal and the reading of the seal. Um, it has three registers. The first register is broken, but it's probably a grazing doe. Um, the second register is, it reads, belonging to Yeshayahu, or Isaiah. The last letter is mis missing, but that's pretty easy to reconstruct. And then the, the, the third register um, reads, and I, uh, um, Professor Mazar reconstructed it, and I would agree. I just wrote a long article on this. Um, that the third register reads prophet, or Navi. So it has his, his title, Navi. And the question is, why does Isaiah have a seal, right? Who is he and what, why does he have a seal, right? Um, well, I want to tell you a story about this title, prophet. And I'll start the story with another passage in the book of Samuel, which is kind of an interesting passage. Saul is looking for his donkeys, and he can't find them, and he, and he makes this uh, suggestion, well, let's go and say, inquire of somebody. And the boy answers Saul and says, here, I have with me a quarter shekel of silver. I will give it to the man of God to tell us our way to find the donkeys. And then it goes on with this para parenthetical statement. Formerly in Israel, anyone went, who went to inquire of God would say, come, let us go to the seer, or the ro'eh in Hebrew. Um, for the one who is now called the a prophet, a navi, was formerly called a seer, right? So apparently the word prophet is a new term, um, at least in the edit, edit, to the editor of the book of Samuel. And he wants to explain this new term that they're incorporating. Um, and that's an important part of understanding um, the history of prophet and Isaiah. Okay. Now let's look at this title, Prophet, in a variety of different places. This is one of the most famous passages that, of, a, of a prophet, and this is the, uh, the story of Amos, right? And according to um, uh, Amos 7, um, Amos, the priest of Bethel says to Amos, Amos has conspired against you at the very center of the house of Israel. The land cannot bear his words. And Amos... Um, O oh, seer, go, flee away from the land of Judah, own your, uh, to the land of Judah, earn your bread there, and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, right? For it is the king's sanctuary and the place and the palace of the kingdom. So he's saying, get out of here, Amos. And then Amos replies in this very famous passage, you know, I am not a prophet, nor am I the son of the prophet. And, you, you know, we all go, come on. Like, Amos, you're not a prophet. If, Who's a prophet if Amos isn't a prophet, right? Isaiah, right? Of course he's a prophet. What is he saying? Somehow Amos has it in his mind that the title prophet is associated with the king's sanctuary, the palace of the kingdom, royal administration. That's an admi a royal administrative uh, title for someone who's working in royal administration. Okay? Now, um, Let's look at what's going on in the seal of Isaiah then. Let's look a little more carefully at its archaeological context. It was found in the Ophel region of Jerusalem. The red, you see the red arrow here on the bottom left. Um, this is the administrative district between the city of David and the Temple Mount. Um, and in this area, it was excavated by Alat Mazar, um, and she has... Uh, excavation reports that came out just a couple years ago. And they found the Isaiah seal impression, but they found 34 other seal impressions. They found another, a number of the um, lamellic seal impressions, those royal seal impressions that I showed you earlier. They also found a seal impression of Hezekiah the king. You know this, one, this guy, right? Ten feet away, 
uh, 10 meters away, less than 10 meters away, they found a, a seal belonging to Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, the, the, king, uh, the king of Judah, right? Um, and of course, we know these two are joined at the hip in, in the Bible, right? Um, I don't think this is coincidental. Oops. I don't think this association of these two uh, people are, are co is coincidental. And, you know, some people would say, oh, you know, maybe there were lots of Isaiahs running around Jerusalem in the late 8th century, and this isn't necessarily our Isaiah. But actually, until they discovered this seal impression in this area, they had never found a seal that had the name Isaiah in any excavation ever in Israel. They found, they found on the antiquities market, there are a bunch of them, in other words, people are, I would say, forging them and, and selling them, but they never excavated a seal with the name Isaiah on it. Um, so there's that. The, the other thing is, if you look at the seal impression of um, Isaiah, this is what I would call an, an, a finely carved seal. Whoever owned this seal had money. They had status. You know, you see, I, I've read hundreds and hundreds of seals, and you can tell the ones who, are, who had money to, to uh, commission the, the, the seal. And you can tell the people who are like, okay, how can I, how can I get this on the cheap, right? Um, so this is not, uh, you know, a, you know, 20-year-old um, fiat. You know, this is, you know, a Ferrari of seals, right? Um, now, what makes it even more interesting then is just... In the same excavation area, they found this seal um, belonging to Ido Yahu, the son of Isaiah. Now, they had never found a seal with Isaiah's name before. Now we have two seals in the same area with the name Isaiah on it. Only this seal is not Isaiah, it's the son of Isaiah. Now, who is this son of Isaiah? We don't know him from the Bible. I'm not re really sure whether he's the son of Isaiah or the apprentice of Isaiah. I look at other texts, for example, with this name, Ido Yahu, right? And Ido is a name, or this root, Ayin Dalet, Dalet in Hebrew, is known all over. And it's a name that's a specifically associated with people who are prophets in the Bible. So in Zechariah, the prophet uh, Zechariah, the son of Barachiah, the son of Ido, right? Uh, in Ezra, the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Ido. Rehoboam, in, um, in the book of Chronicles, Rehoboam's uh, records are written in the records of the seer, Ido. Um, other place, you know, um, the history of Abijah is written in the Midrash of the prophet Ido. And actually, we also know this name in other inscriptions. So in, in an Aramaic inscription from, uh, from Zakor, um, we find Baal spoke to me through the Idos, or seers. So this is a title for prophets that's known in outside of the uh, Bible as well. So then it becomes really interesting, right? That the name of this person, the son of Isaiah, or apprentice of Isaiah, is actually a name that's associated with the prophetic job, or um, uh, profession. Um, and it reminds me of this passage in Isaiah 8, right? Where it says, bind up the teaching among my students, see I and the children whom the Lord has given me, right? The prophets had sons or apprentices that worked with them. We see it in a lot of different kinds of um, uh, biblical texts and other inscriptions as well. So, for example, at the city of Lachish or Lachish, they found two seal impressions, um, with the inscription belonging to Jeremiah, the son of Zephaniah, the son of the prophet. Now, this is a seal of, of I would say, a fiat. <laughs> this is an old fiat seal. You know, it's not a very good seal um, in terms of its execution and quality, especially if we compared it with the Isaiah seal. But um, he's only the son of a prophet. <laughs> he's, only he's only an apprentice in some ways. Um, I think this is his title. And if we look at the archaeological context that it was found, it was actually found in a jar that contained 17 different seals, and so, some of the other seals had other official titles, like royal steward, servant of the king, son of the king. There was a 
a, a letter, Lakish number 22, which is an administrative list that was found here. There are also weights, inscribed weights that were found here. So in this particular context, these seals were found in clearly administrative context. So what I'm suggesting to you is that prophet or son of the prophet is an administrative title, right? Originally, in, in Isaiah's time, it wasn't the prophet like we know. So what happened? Well, very interesting. Um, the title was transformed. And you can see the transformation of this title in the book of Jeremiah. Now, without going into the, the, the details of the book of Jeremiah, there are two versions of the book of Ver Jeremiah. There's a long version and a short version. The short version is probably the early version of the book of Jeremiah. We know it from the Septuagint, or the Greek version, but we also have Hebrew versions of the short version of Jeremiah in Qumran, among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, and then there's the Masoretic text, so the ones that we find in most of our Bibles, which is the long version of the book of Jeremiah, which is about 15% longer. And there are a bunch of really minor changes and additions, nothing really significant. But one of the really significant things that the long version and the short version do is you can see right here. This is the short version of the Septuagint uh, that's represented by the Septuagint. This is actually available in a widely available translation, the New English translation of the Septuagint or the Net or Net. So go to Amazon, you can buy the Septuagint Bible translation. But you see what they did in verse 2, and he struck him. But then in the, the Masoretic text, or our Bibles, um, then Pashur struck the prophet Jeremiah. And this happens 27 or 28 times in the Septuagint uh, to the Masoretic text. The title prophet is basically not really given to Jeremiah in the short original version of the book. It's only in the longer version of the book of Jeremiah that over and over again, he spoke to him, the prophet Jeremiah, you know, and Yermias, this is Greek, right? The prophet Jeremiah stood in the house of the Lord and Jeremiah, no, no, the prophet Jeremiah. The Masoretic text is making a point to use this title, prophet, to relabel Jeremiah's identity. Jeremiah was a priest, and they're making him into a prophet um, in a repeated and consistent way. This is what's going on in the editing of the book of Jeremiah. It's telling you something about what's going on with the title prophet. And the question is, like, where did they get this title? prophet. I w will go uh, tell you they got the title prophet from Isaiah of Jerusalem. Here he is in his seal with the title in an administrative context of Jerusalem. He was Isaiah, the prophet of Hezekiah the king. But he became such an important figure in um, Jerusalem's history that his title was appropriated. And then in the later editing of the, of the Bible, they begin to call everyone prophets. They're saying, you know, you got to be like Isaiah. He was a prophet. And, they re and they, they're essentially redefining what it meant to be a prophet in the editing and, and uh, development of, of Scripture. And so then David becomes a prophet, and Moses becomes a prophet, and Aaron becomes a prophet. And Jeremiah becomes a prophet, even though he was a priest. Um, his title, and why are they doing it? They're doing it because Isaiah of Jerusalem. He became the archetype figure of the concept of a prophet, and then they reapplied it in a variety of different ways. He became that because the, day, the, the days and the times of Isaiah were so important to the development of uh, ideas about Jerusalem, about the temple, um, the development of scripture. Isaiah was the critical person. He lived in these very interesting times. In some ways, I would say, times not unlike we're living in today. So that's a, a whirlwind tour. Sorry that I crammed so much into this. Um, 
But I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have uh, about anything. And I have a microphone if you want to speak. I'm a little confused about the timeline for the Septuagint, which was um, an early BC translation of the Hebrew Bible from right. Hebrew. And then you reference the Masoretic text. Mm -hmm. when, is, when was the Masoretic version uh, created? Okay, so this is, this is why it, the Septu that's, this is why the Dead Sea Scrolls are so important, because um, it tells us something about the history of the Masoretic text. Um, the Septuagint itself is a translation that begins in the third century BC in Alexandria. So third, second, maybe first century, you know, uh, BC in Alexandria. But they have a version of the book of um, Jeremiah there. And it's a slightly different version than the book of Jeremiah that we have in the Masoretic text. Different theories about why, but you know, in a nutshell, you have to read my new book, but um, it's coming out in the end of this year. But um, in a nutshell, there's a version of Jeremiah that goes to Egypt with Jeremiah, and there's a version of Jeremiah that goes to um, Mesopotamia or Babylon with the exiles there, and they both come back to Jerusalem, and then they harmonize them, but, but the Egyptian version um, stays in, um, retains some of its um, shorter characteristics. Um, and the, the reason the Dead Sea Scrolls are important be, is because among the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have Hebrew versions of the book of Jeremiah that are very, very similar to the Septuagint version of the book of Jeremiah. So it shows you that there were early Hebrew versions of the Septuagint. So the Septuagint is based on an earlier, um, you know, shorter, slightly shorter text than the Masoretic uh, text. Um, now that's the, like, that's the short and um, uncomplicated version. I mean, scholars really debate, you know, how to c come to grips with the problem of the short Jeremiah. Um, when does the Mas Masoretic text come into existence? Well, I mean, the Proto-Masoretic, I mean, I'm talking about the Proto-Masoretic text. I think that the Proto-Masoretic text of Jeremiah comes into existence probably in the late 6th century. Um, so in Jerusalem, in the temple archives, they have floating around two different versions of the book of, of Jeremiah probably. Um, at some point, those versions are harmonized, or harmonized, if you will, and so you only have one version. That process is probably being t taking place in the late second century BC, first century BC, where they begin creating what we call the Proto-Masoretic text. The Masoretic text itself is like the seventh century AD, right? So um, that's the version of the Bible that most people use or focus on when they translate. You know, every once in a while in your footnotes, it'll say, oh, you know, or, you know, see the Septuagint reading here. Sometimes the Septuagint has a superior reading. I don't really think that this I wouldn't say that the Septuagint has superior readings. It has alternate readings. I think that, bo that both of them are telling the message of, of God. Um, and in some ways, I would say both of them are scripture. Um, but you see in comparing them that something's going on, right? Something's going on in the interpretation of the book and understanding of who Jeremiah was. In this movement... Jeremiah is going from being a priest to being a prophet. They're redefining who Jeremiah's identity is. That's really, that's really fun and interesting. And the question is, why do people want to redefine Jeremiah's identity? And that's a whole nother fun talk um, that we can't have right here. But 
it's really interesting, and, and I think part of the story of, of Scripture, things that things Scripture are talking about, and, and, you know, I think when you put it in these kind of contexts about, like, changing identity and the problems of identity, I mean, these become really interesting pr- current um, topics that are happening in antiquity. So, uh, Bill, uh, this uh, school of Isaiah that you are talking about, it would continue for generations, I suppose. Would they re- be responsible for what we now call Second Isaiah? Uh, would they take it upon themselves to expand the uh, the scroll of Isaiah? Yeah, I think it's more complicated than that, you know. And this, it's actually this is the topic of my new book, uh, Andy. Um, but. In the, second, in the first temple period, in the time of Isaiah, I think there's a group of the, the sons of the prophets, and that's a scribal community. But in the Babylonian exile, all scribal communities are destroyed, right? So if, if I look at, in the time of Hezekiah, there are priestly scribal communities, there are peripheral priestly scribal communities, there are merchant scribal communities, there are social... There are soldier scribal communities, and I identify all these different kind of scribal communities that are running around in the Iron Age in in the new book that that I've just finished writing for Princeton. But then the Babylonian exile comes. Everything is destroyed. All these different kinds of diversity in scribal communities are destroyed. And then at the end of the Persian, uh, at the end of the Babylonian period into the earlier Persian period, people, priests in Jerusalem are collecting everything. There's really just one scribal community that's going to emerge out of this, and this is a priestly scribal community. And they are collecting things, and it's this group um, in the you know, late Babylonian and, and early Persian period that are responsible for what scholars call second and third Isaiah. I don't really fully subscribe to the simple distinction between first, second, and third Isaiah, but the principles of what they're talking about are certainly right, that, it, that, that, that the formation of the book of Isaiah is a process. It's not a moment. It isn't written in the 8th century or 7th century and then rewritten, you know, or added to by one person in the, you know, late 6th century and then another person in the early 5th century. It's, it, that's not how it happens. It's much more of an organic, rolling corpus, um, in my opinion. But... As you know better than anyone, Andy, um, the, the fights over the exact nature of the composition of Isaiah are, among scholars, are legion, right? Um, but you can see the complicated process. I tried to illustrate a little bit of the complicated process here. I don't think um, we can simplify it the way modern scholarship does. At lunch, you told us a little bit of your background and how you came to this scholarship. And if you can just, in a nutshell, I think the audience would really appreciate it and, you know, where, which religious denominations you and your wife have been connected to. Oh, sure. So, um, I come from a German Lutheran background. Schneidewind, right? Yeah, German Lutheran. We were pretty nominal in our religious tradition when I was growing up. Um, but that was my background. I went to George Fox University as an undergraduate, which is a Quaker school, and I became very um, excited about the Quaker, di- different aspects of the Quaker tradition. Um, so th- in college, I became a Quaker, and that's how I identify myself reali- uh, religiously. My wife comes from a Catholic background, and um, and now she's an elder at Bel Air Presbyterian Church, so, you know, um, I'm, I would, you know, I'm not that theologically oriented, you know, but I would say I identify, you know, as an, uh, as a Christian, and if, like, if you press me, I would say, I like the, I like the Quaker tradition for a whole variety of different reasons, um, you know, radical inclusi- inclusivity, you know, issues of, you know, emphasis on social justice, you know, um, concepts of inner light, you know, all the, all kinds of things I like about the Quaker tradition, but I hold my theological, you know, these kind of 
details of theological beliefs pretty loosely. Um, um, but anyway, so that's my own background, my wife's background. Oh, well, you know, I wish I could speak all these languages, but I am teaching Ugaritic right now, which is a language that was spoken in, in ancient um, northern Syria, Lebanon. And I do Akkadian, and of course Hebrew, and Aramaic, and Greek, and Moabite, Phoenician, Somalian, all these kind of different dialects of, um, you know, this is why they pay us the big bucks at UCLA, you know? <laughs> It's the only place in the world you can come and t study Ugaritic, or not only place, but, you know, if you want to study Ugaritic or Somalian um, or ancient Hebrew um, inscriptions, you know, you come, come study with me at UCLA. I also work a lot in archaeology, you know, um, trying to get started a new excavation with UCLA, so we'll see if we can get money for it, you know, so working on those kinds of things, so. So was Isaiah a prophet for his entire career, or was he promoted to prophet at some point? That is an interesting question. You know, I really believe in this concept of the sons of the prophets. That is, that there's a prophetic community. You see it, especially in the Elijah-Elisha narratives. Um, so at some point in Isaiah's life, he should have been a son of a prophet, right? That is, since essentially, he should have been or Hebrew, we'd say then ar the, the the apprentice of the prophet. He should have been an apprentice, also called the son of the prophet, you know, in, in biblical text. So at some point, Isaiah should have been the son of a prophet. But, you know, I would probably say when he, see, when he sees his vision, you know, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, right? At that point, I think he's probably a prophet in the court of King Hezekiah, um, but maybe not. Maybe he's still, maybe he's still apprenticed then. We don't really know. I mean, but in the times of Hezekiah and when most of the book of Isaiah is written, he is the prophet in Jerusalem. And, you know, he's the most famous figure um, in Jerusalem. And he becomes, of course, you know, it's like his claim to fame. The salvation of Jerusalem is something that he helped orchestrate and was a major figure in. And so that created the celebrity of Isaiah that lasted through all the generations. Well, you're, you're assuming that the role of the prophet is to criticize, right? That, you know, in other words, the later reception and, and concept of, of the prophet um, as a, you know, social critic is the main concept of the earlier times. That's not clear that it was the main role. Now, sometimes it is the role of a, a royal advisor, right, to, um, to give advice, and sometimes you don't want to hear the advice, and sometimes the best royal advisors are the ones who are willing to tell you the truth, right, or to give you the hard news. Um, but I think that when we look at, you know, and, and this is in much more detail in my book. I, I mean, I, I apologize. I like threw at you like the kitchen sink in this talk of things that I just think, think are really fun and interesting. But, you know, I have a book that's coming out with Princeton University Press called Who Really Wrote the Bible? The Story of Scribal Communities. And that should come out earlier. And then I like give you the long... It's supposed to be a popular book, you know. It's kind of like, uh, well, you know, Bill has a hard time making it as popular as it could be, but I think, I think it's certainly a readable, especially for an audience like you guys. You guys are, like, exactly the target audience for the book that I just finished, so. Then we'll, ha then we'll have Dan read it and review it for us. Well, let's just take a minute and say thank you, thank you for coming. It's just been such a pleasure to hear you. And thank you and to explore some of these ideas, right? Um, and I'm gonna say to all of you, thank you. We are, we are sorting out what's happening with the next Saints Alive program because right now the date that was set for it is right in the middle of Holy Week and we're really wondering about that. So all I can tell you at this point is that just we will communicate
okay, about the next program. But in the meantime, thank you, Dan, and all of you for being here. It's so good to have you, and, um, and stay warm. We're gonna, I'm going to ask that we kind of clear fairly quickly because we have piano movers who are getting us ready for a Music Guild concert this weekend. Thank you. That doesn't mean to hush, hush you out too far, but, you know. <laughs>